Now, I'm going to speak today about a monetary system that are open uh, and that are in the world, in a world of trade. And my quotation at the head of it is, uh, is, uh, is from Henry Thornton. Henry Thornton, in 1802, wrote a really wonderful book. He was a wonderful man in all ways. He belonged to the Clapham Chapel. He was one of the people who fought and, and, won, and won to stop slave trade. And then they went on, and it was the English who, uh, who were the, at the head of uh, doing away with, with slavery. And I think that's something one should always celebrate. But Henry Thornton also wrote a wonderful book on paper credit. And he was a very modest man. But uh, I think his book is one of the best in the history of monetary theory. And he said, the subjects of coin, of paper credit, of the balance of, pay of commerce, and of the exchanges are intimately connected with each other. So coin and paper credit are connected with the balance of commerce and with the exchange of, of currencies. And this is really the topic I'm going to come on today. Now, what I'm going to do is to complete what I did in the previous two lectures. In the first one, I had theories of money and then demand for money. The second one was money supply. And now we're getting supply and, uh, and demand together uh, to complete the picture of monetary equilibrium. Now, Medina Desai, uh, who, uh, Lord Desai, who is a very interesting and peculiar person, because he is a man of the left, no doubt, and during the LSE troubles he was at the head of the student movements and so on. Still, he's a great specialist of Hayek which, uh, and, and Marx, which, and, he, and he survived the split in his mind of those two <laughs> things. And he said, he said that uh, it's different depending on your model, you will, you will think that money supply is exogenous or not. So the wider the model, that is the more open the economy, you will have more influence of what other central banks and what other economies do. So in an open economy, the connections between the national money supply and the rest of the world, they are slow. Uh, they hit back slowly, but in the end they are there. And uh, to put it otherwise, central banks may have the illusion they can create money exogenously, but in time, the pigeons come home to roost and the mistakes uh, are paid for. Of course, there are exaggerated, exaggerated mistakes, as we have in Venezuela today, or we had in Zimbabwe in the past, but still, it's always there. You're not isolated from the rest of the world. Especially a small open country's money supply is not exogenous. Um, I'm thinking of Singapore, I'm thinking of Hong Kong, and other small countries. They uh, have very little leeway for the so monetary sovereignty, which, uh, which you don't have when you're a big currency in a country like the US. But also, in the case of the US, there's some feedback from the rest of the world to you. And, uh, and therefore, when we say, when we think of money supply as exogenous, that is, decisions of the central bank about money supply, we mustn't forget that this is under certain conditions. And this is something we may discuss. Uh, at, at the end of my lecture. Now, the inspiration for this lecture is the wonderful book of Jacob Weiner. He wrote a book, he said, on the history of international trade, studies in the history of international trade. But the first, I think it's five chapters, no, the first four chapters or three chapters are all about money. Uh, because he saw that money, of course, as David Hume said, uh, had said and so on, money is intimately connected with what the economy does respecting outside. Now, mercantilists uh, uh, who only want to defend groups of national producers from foreign competition traditionally fear that the country would never have enough money uh, if the exchanges were not controlled. And I brought here a book which I'm going to leave in the library uh, here. It's the translation of a Spanish book, the only Spanish book that Adam Smith uh, had in his library. I, a gentleman called Geronimo de Staris, uh, and Geronimo, the, the translation is by uh, Kipax, uh, 
a, a very good translator, wasn't an economist, perhaps that's why. He was a, a doctor of divinity. And what, what, he, what he said was, um, <coughs> what he said is that uh, this thesis, um, what, what he did is to try and defend, that the says try and defend foreign trade that would not empty the country of money. And so you had to be careful on the terms where you exchange goods and services, which is a theory or an idea that is again in force today. You have it with the President of the United States, who thinks that he must intervene in the balance of payments because there are problems there that he can stop by the, the power of the state. And this is what Rousseau said at that time, and of course Adam Smith criticized it. So this is a, po a point that I wanted to make. So when, when you understand the specie flow mechanism, which is a mechanism described beautifully by David Hume, and you combine that with Gresham's law, which says that an overvalued currency will expel the undervalued currency, in the case of Britain, it was gold that was overvalued by Newton, and it expelled silver from the uh, circulation. You have these two things together, then you can explain the monetary movements of the, of the balance of payments, and uh, you can see that uh, they are best led to themselves. And that is the main classical uh, lesson that we have to learn. So, again, I'll go back to... The, uh, to the school of Salamanca to show how very far back uh, these ideas were, that is the connection between the quantity of money and the exchanges. And secondly, not only that, but <clears throat> how, uh, how far back and how the same problem comes up again and again. Uh, one of the themes of his lectures is that money is an abstract institution and that the problems posed by money haven't changed much. The solutions proposed may have, but the problems are the same, are the same in the 15th and 16th century as they are today. So Aspilqueta, whom I, of whom I spoke in a, in a previous lecture, in 1556 spoke about the exchanges and he said, when there is a general lack of money, it is not that the ducat is worth more reales, but it is that all money is worth more because as more saleable things can be found, at so much per money than before. So it's the, the uh, purchasing, power, uh, purchasing power of the currency that will give you the exchanges. And then there's another, uh, another friar, Tomás de Mercado, uh, in Spanish, a beautiful writer of Spanish, typical of the time. He, it is said that he was born in New Spain, in Mexico today, and that he went to Seville, where, where the uh, merchants asked him to uh, write a report on whether their business was moral or not uh, because there was this fear that if you made money, especially if you made money with, with interest, then there might be usury and that was forbidden. And so they asked the guys <coughs> to, uh, to tell them what, what was wrong with their business. And Thomas de Mercal said, it's your right to charge, some, to charge uh, something on the ducats that come to Seville when you send them to, to, to um, Anvers in, in the Low Countries, because in the Low Countries they are very uh, they are expensive. You have less money. All as I said, there are two points in this chapter to discover and clarify. The first is that money changes are based on the current estimation of money. Not bad for for the for 1571. Never do the exchanges carry such great interests, that is interest that is the deduction you make for sending money out, uh, as the remittances that are made to places where it is evident that money is much appreciated. Where is it and why is it much appreciated? And the second is that from Seville to Medina del Campo and to Lisbon and any other places in the low countries we then spoke, what makes the markets the market fall or rise is the abundance or dearth of silver. If there is much, the exchanges are low, that is, a, there's a discount of a, of, a, of a currency where there's much, a great deal of silver, and it is clear that the abundance or lack leads to its being much more esteemed 
or little. So you have that as, as early as the um, 16th century. Now, Jerome du Stade, whose books are here translated into English, <coughs> um, is quoted in the World of Nations for the bad effect of the Spanish uh, the planet, um, tax system, the Alcabala, which was a tax on sales. But I, I want to quote Ustari more the other way. John Kipax is translated in the introduction, put it this way, to import only for that the country, the state should be careful to import only from countries that take growth and produce of Spain in return, instead of encouraging those that must be paid for their manufactures entirely in bullion, and who thus, in time, extract the very vitals of the kingdom. This could be a Twitter uh, that we could read today. So uh, the answer to this is the self-regulating species flow. And the locus classicus for this idea is, of course, David Hume's 1752 political discourses. He started, in a, though he was a philosopher, um, he had his weaknesses, and so he started as an economist, uh, assuming that four-fifths of the money, of all the money in Great Britain, was annihilated overnight. And, and then he say, goes to see what would happen to the circulation of bullion or gold and silver, <coughs> and in this case it was gold, in, in Britain. He said, as soon as you have the destruction of so much money, British prices and wages would fall, foreign competition would be overwhelmed, and the difference in exports would be paid in money until the level of money, as I said, would be restored to its former equilibrium. And we'll see now what the mechanisms were that he studied or are studied today to say that. So uh, there was no need for the government to worry and intervene. And again, um, if I may say so to enlighten, to uh, make this lecture a bit lighter, uh, I am always surprised today when people speak of the catastrophe that, uh, the, uh, that the taxes on imports uh, or the European Union uh, or the harm they would cause in, in the UK and there would be no way to export or, uh, and they forget about the, the, the exchange rate. Uh, the exchange rate and other mechanisms will make the uh, will make the level of money to be resolved where it was before. So, which things did um, David Hume look at as possible parts of the mechanism? I've just said relative price changes. Um, the uh, this was the first mechanism for Hume, and in fact the only one for Ricardo when he wrote the high price of bullion in 1810 as a, as a comment on the Bullion Committee. Uh, but then it's, it can be goods and services flows. Imports are purchased with exports. And one of the things that I want to put to you in different parts of this lecture is that, yes, money is important. It has an effect on the real economy. Um, but when you look at uh, foreign trade, at bottom, you pay your imports with exports. The services you import, you pay them with the services you export. And this is reflected in the exchange rate and other things. But the central thing is what happens in the real economy. And that is something that, uh, of course, Hume understood. Uh, he didn't mention income movements. Uh, if you have a devaluation of, of the sovereign or of the pound, or whatever, due to uh, the fact that you're um, importing more than you export, then that has an effect also on people. It has a wealth effect. People with a lower pound will feel poorer and therefore will tend to buy uh, fewer imports. Then the terms of trade were all already uh, in Hume, and they were di discussed later by Orly and Keynes on the German reparations. The compensating movements of interest rates. Obviously, uh, a deficit in the balance of paper will have an effect on the interest rate in England or Britain and uh, abroad. 
and that will also compensate for the devaluation. De and finally, he did, David Hume did mention changes in the exchange rates, because he said uh, people are worried by the fact that there's a, a lower appreciation of the pound, uh, or there's a premium of foreign on foreign uh, monies in, in the money market, and that's something that also helps to correct the deficit in the balance of payments. Uh, some he mentioned, some others he didn't, but the way to put as a model, suppose that in one night four fifths of the money is disappeared, is a lovely way that we, uh, of, of the way that we economists tend to think. Now, <clears throat> how does the classical gold standard operate in the gold in the economy? You cannot speak of the gold standard if you don't speak about international trade. There'll be movements of gold in compensation for uh, what you buy abroad and vice versa. And therefore, as soon as you speak of the gold standard, your model has a dimension of foreign, uh, of, of foreign exchanges. The central price uh, set by Newton was three pounds seventeen shillings, ten point five pence uh, per uh, per unit of gold, and uh, and there, there of course above and below that price, uh, what you had is the gold points. That means uh, the different the moment when if the the pound became too too cheap, then people will try and, and bring some gold from abroad, and it won't happen until the price which you bring it here will cover the costs of imports and insurance, and vice versa. So, the if the uh, and then the discount rate in in the functioning of a gold standard, uh, you you had a central bank, the Bank of England in this case not being paralyzed or being asleep. What they, if they saw that there were reductions in their reserve, in their gold reserves, they would not wait until the, the loss of gold reserves would make all the prices in, the, in, the, in Great Britain fall. They would forestall that by changing the, uh, by changing the uh, rate of discount at the back. The rate of discount would be increased if there was a fall in the reserves of Bank of England uh, and we'll see later that we have two uh, reasons to worry about the fall in the uh, in the Bank of England uh, reserves. Uh, and I'll leave it for a second now. So, when internal demand for gold or liquidity increases due to a financial crisis, they said uh, people was within slowly was within the function of the gold standard. Then the discount rate could be lowered. Uh, this was along the 19th century. Uh, the idea that uh, that the central bank had to take action uh, if uh, there was a financial crisis. Not only as we should see, there was uh, the proposal of the um, lender of last resort, an idea that has been attributed mainly to uh, to Walter Badger, but in fact was in Henry Thornton, very clearly, very well put in 1802. Uh, not only that, but also you use the discount rate to try and lessen the sense of crisis. <clears throat> now, it's the banking school, that is, the group of economists who were critical of Ricardo and uh, his disciples, who studied the possible movements or the possible policy that the central bank to the Bank of England should follow. Uh, Thomas Took and John Fullerton uh, underlined the invention of banknotes and bank deposits. The banknotes and bank deposits modified the functioning of the gold standard because it's not only coins and bullion uh, that influenced the level of prices in, in Great Britain, the country, but also the fact that people had substituted for gold and have substituted for, uh, for, for ingots, they substituted bank credit and deposits. And of course, the increase in the amount of bank credits and deposits that you had in the country had an influence 
on the function of the, uh, of the of gold standard. And we have that today, too. Uh, today, when most of the economies of the advanced countries are bankerized, as we should say, that is, they have, uh, they have deposit accounts and, and so on, then uh, we have to look at the connection between money supply and the, and the price level and interest rates. We have to look at them in a different way. Uh, and you cannot stay um, with the idea that, uh, as we shall see to the day after tomorrow, with the idea that the base, base money, or M0, is the only thing you have to look at. You also have to look at the substitute for money that, uh, that you uh, were invented in the 30s, or used in the 30s, uh, more and, and more sedulously. So for them, uh, they of the banking school thought that it was enough that you know, there was a, a guarantee of convertibility. And this is an idea of Adam Smith, which is that in the end, if paper money or the deposits were convertible aside on, uh, into gold coins or perhaps uh, gold bullion, then if there was a, an excess of issue of deposits and of issue of, uh, of banknotes, in the end that would come back and people would know about it and come to the bank and ask gold for it and that would be uh, a way of making the excessive uh, increase or the excessive issue of paper and of deposits flow back to the banks and so that was a discipline enough for them. That's something we could, we could um, argue with, but that's what they thought. And so for them there was a reflux of money into if there was convertibility, and that's exactly what Adam Smith also thought. So they distinguished, and this is interesting from the point of view of financial crisis. Financial crisis really started at the end of the 18th century, but they were a phenomenon that puzzled economists in the first part, at least, of the 19th century. The first big crisis was in, at the end, after Waterloo, at the end of the Napoleonic War uh, in 1819. Uh, uh, that was a big financial crisis. The next one is 1825, and then you had 1830, and then you had 1837, and um, 1840, and so on. A number of 56, 67, and so on. The crisis that puzzled John Stuart Mill, as uh, I will say in a minute. So you had, why did these happen? After all, the economy was on a gold stamp. There was a reflux of, uh, there, there couldn't be, in the end, there couldn't be an excessive issue of, of, of paper money or of deposits. Um, there couldn't be because in the end people would take it to the banks. There was a reflux. How could it be that you had these financial uh, crises? And these financial crises also put doubt on Say's law. Say's law says that what is important in the economy is the supply of goods. There will always be a demand for the supply of goods, and therefore there's no worry to have a general oversupply uh, of goods in the economy. So by, by gosh, I mean, <laughs> in 1825, for, for at least, there was a, a huge oversupply. I think that... Uh, no, I haven't got it, so I haven't put it here, but in another... But I'm going to go through it because it's interesting. John Stuart Mill uh, was, of course, a great defender of Sage Law. He'd been taught by his father. And in 1825, he, uh, he was 19, uh, right economist at the time. And so he wrote a most interesting uh, essay, which he published later in 1843. And that essay was called, and it's almost Keynesian in the title, of the influence of consumption on production. And how could he say that? Does that mean that Say's law wouldn't function properly? Uh, what he said is that if you have money in the economy, you can sell without buying. And you can treasure the, uh, the currency, and therefore for a time, it will make people... The produce of people not find an issue, to find a way out. And that, that idea of John Stuart Mill uh, was a very early one, and it did tell us of difficulties all through the, uh, the century. 
uh, the idea that there could be financial financial crisis under the gold standard. And, and that uh, is a, con it's a conundrum we, for them, and it is also for us. So in the first part of the century, these things happen. In 1844, there was a new law, Peel's law, that separated, uh, Peel's was a very Ricardian law, that, that law, separated the issue department from the Bank, department of, the Bank of England, and therefore uh, it was a very strict gold standard uh, arrangement. And still, there were these financial, these financial crises. In the second part of the 19th century, the economists started looking at these financial crises and see why they happened and what could the remedy be, especially Jevons and Marshall uh, and uh, Knight and others uh, looked, looked at them and see what, what was happening. So 19th century was a period of learning about how an open economy with a solid currency still have, can have a uh, financial crisis. <clears throat> uh, at the time, uh, around 18, uh, 1865, uh, there was an attempt by France to displace the gold standard and to create a standard on silver to uh, take away from the city, from the London financial market, a part of its business. Again, this is not very, very new, because it's happening again, again um, uh, in, uh, today. Again, how, how to get the business of London to Frankfurt or to Paris, or whatever. Well, they, uh, the, the, the Napoleon, the Emperor Napoleon III, decided to try and have a silver exchange standard and wrote or signed an agreement with Belgium, Switzerland, and Italy. Um, the agreement wasn't signed with Spain, but our currencies, were, our coins, were of the same weight and denomination as the coins that uh, the French uh, government created. And that didn't last very much uh, for a following reason, which is that the Italians and the Vatican Treasury uh, issued silver coins of lower law, of lower quality. And according to the agreement with France, they could take those bad silver coins to the French central bank and get the good French silver coins. And they did the same with uh, Switzerland. And in the end, Switzerland said, look, here, we can't go on like this, and the, and the Bank of France neither could go on for that. So in 1873, the system was suspended. Of course, as Things happened with international law. The treaty was uh, the treaty was maintained was was valid until 1927, but it's 1873 when they uh, when they gave up. The uh, uh, the treasurer of the Vatican was the last cardinal who was not a priest, and he was in charge of uh, doing this scum. I don't know what what uh, school of Salamanca would have said to this. But anyhow, it stopped the Latin Monetary Union from, from functioning. The story I told in the second lecture was one of how, with trip-ups and difficulties and so on, a system of metallic money was turned into a system of fiat money, or paper money, so to speak, of, of uh, bank accounts. This went very slowly. There were early attempts, as uh, John Law tried in France, and so on. And slowly during the 19th century, and certainly during the 20th century, the idea that you didn't, you didn't need a backing of metal to have value for your currency spread. And after the, the First World War, uh, when during the war the, um, the uh, gold standard was suspended, after the First World War, uh, it became clear that you could have uh, a currency that was paper, or a currency that was based on faith, and not based uh, on faith in the state or in the central bank, and there was not faith on metal. And uh, um, one of the persons who most accurately and admirably put, uh, or explained the system after, uh, after what had happened, the system of fiat money, 
what John, John Maynard Keynes in his structure of monetary reform. Now, Keynes may have sinned a lot later in life, and I must say that this tract is a wonderful, wonderful read. It's so clear, and he explained the system perfectly. So he said, what he basically said, if you fix, if you fix the exchange rate, the exchanges of the pound to the dollar, then it's the Fed who governs your economy. That governs your economy. If you have a floating exchange rate, then you can govern your price level. The price level, in the case of the fixed exchange rate, is fixed somewhere else. And the price level, if you have a floating exchange rate, is fixed by the Bank of England. And uh, whenever I have students who want to understand how the monetary system works in an open economy, this is the book to read. I think it's, uh, it's wonderfully written. Um, and uh, and um, he sh shows how Keynes <coughs> really understood uh, money. Whatever happened later, it will leave for another day. <coughs> so uh, what he preferred, Keynes said, is to have a flexible exchange rate so that the price level of, of England or Britain would be governed by the Bank of England and not governed by the Fed. And this is what he defended in this, uh, in this wonderful short pamphlet of 1923. <clears throat> now, here we go to the later days. And Bretton Woods. I've jumped the 1936 general theory for good reasons, but I, I go to Bretton Woods. <clears throat> now, uh, in the 1923 tract, Keynes defended the idea of monetary sovereignty in the hands of the Bank of, it, of England, that is, of the price level being determined by the Bank of England. But uh, he re realized, and many people realized, that what had happened in, in the 30s, after the World War and the move to a flexible, to, to uh, move to paper money, so to speak, and to a flex flexible exchange rate, was exchange rate wars and also uh, a reduction or a control of foreign, of foreign trade and all sorts of terrible things that happened during the, in the 30s up to the, uh, up to the Second World War. So during the Second World War, active treasury, where Keynes again had been engaged to, uh, to work as an economist uh, in defense of his country, he did that in the First World War and did it again as a junior, and then he was a very important person in, in the Second uh, during the Second World War, uh, he, he proposed that there should be an international currency, which he called Bancor. It's one of the many international currencies he proposed during those years, but it's the one that he really put his effort behind. So it was the idea that the, uh, the gold standard had worked very well during the 19th century. It's extraordinary how, with a fixed exchange rate, uh, and a exchange rate that was totally out of the hands of the authorities, you could have the growth you had in the 19th century. That was really unbelievable. Uh, and people, there was this superstition uh, of gold, uh, which uh, Keynes abhorred. Well, uh, when uh, Britain, I mean, the United Kingdom, left the uh, gold standard in 1931, uh, and uh, two things happened, which I want to underline. One was that all the bells in the church of the country were rung, because the uh, because the the, uh, the, the the ties that were binding the economy to to gold uh, uh, were broken. And the second one was a reaction by the by the um, Labour Party. Party. Prime Minister of National Government, we said, we didn't know it could be done, that one could get rid of, uh, of the gold standard. And so what we had that is the, the big jump away from the gold standard and towards uh, monetary sovereignty as in 1923. But the effect of that kind of commercial and exchange wars that you had in, in between the wars uh, had obviously been a disaster. And so Keynes always tried, and also the Americans tried, to have a monetary system with a sort of fixed uh, bear, fixed uh, point, 
so that you didn't have these fights over trade and over money and over the exchange rates. And uh, so he proposed the Bank Hall, which was, uh, he tried, having a, a gold standard system without the gold standard uh, bad things. So you were on the gold standard, but if by any chance your balance of payments went deep into, in, into negative ter ter territory, then you could devalue. So it was uh, a promise, it was, I promise I will keep the exchange rate fixed, but you always have the door out uh, to devalue if necessary. So he wanted to obtain the stability of the gold standard without the rigidity of the gold standard. And fixing the exchange of the main currency allowed exceptional rearrangement in his proposal, the proposal he took to Bretton Woods. And to uh, avoid the problems that the gold standard pose and that this system could pose, he said, if country, some country has an excess, uh, excessive surplus in the balance of payments, then they should be uh, punished in a way. And vice versa the same. If you have an excess deficit in, the, uh, uh, in your balance of payments, then you, uh, you had to uh, pay an interest rate on what the deficit was. I won't go into details because it wasn't applied. So uh, the, the point was, to avoid exchange control limits of international trade. Now, we mustn't forget that in the history of money, there are good, good progressive changes, as the one that we've seen with, from metal to paper and so on. And there are new inventions that are monstrous. And one of them uh, should be attributed to Mr. Halmya Schacht, who was the governor of the Bank of, of Germany, the Reichsbank, and uh, in uh, 1923, very difficult times for Germany because they, they had a higher inflation before that, and so he invented something which was which wasn't uh, which was used under mercantilism, but but uh, uh, in a different way. He invented exchange controls and capital controls, and once. Again, we didn't know we could do that. And so people started uh, controlling the exchanges and controlling capital, capital movements. And that allowed countries to isolate their economy from the rest of the world. I, uh, and this is exactly what uh, Schacht was able to do. First, uh, under the Weimar Republic, as a head of, uh, of the uh, Reichsbank, and then as a minister of economics for uh, with Hitler, though so he uh, was, was punished by Hitler for, for being suspected of wanting to, punished by the SS for suspecting of wanting to displace Hitler from, from power. Um, so the idea was suddenly we have a new instrument, and this instrument is we can try and control the exchanges. And if we control the exchanges and we control uh, capital movements, then we can do all sorts of things inside the country, and this is what. Uh, what, uh, what he wanted to avoid, what Keynes wanted to avoid. Now Keynes faced a, a very peculiar gentleman uh, uh, at Bretton Woods, Harry Dexter White, uh, who uh, is now known, was uh, supplied the information to the Soviet Union um, for free, never charged. He wasn't a, a spy on the, on the books of the Soviet Union, but he, Exchange because he hated empire. And Harry Dexter White and all Americans thought that the, the England, the British Empire, the Churchill defended so strongly, was something that had to disappear. And so Harry Dexter White um, insisted on the preeminence of the dollar against these newfangled ideas that Keynes was proposing. And so then we entered into not the gold exchange standard, but the, gold, the, the dollar standard. So here we have now another step. Going back to the 1923 uh, Keynes pamphlet, and that is the case for flexible exchange rates, published in 1953 uh, by Admiral uh, Milton Friedman. Now, uh, this was a time when you still wear under Bretton Woods system, whereby currencies were tied to an exchange rate, 
when, when tied to that exchange rate book, they had ba a back door by which they could leave the system and have a devaluation of 10%. If it was more, the IMF had to permit it, but it could be more than 10%. So uh, Friedman said, fixing the exchange rates of countries is a mistake. In the end, the market will, will uh, push uh, those doors open. And so what Friedman proposed, uh, was A, you should have flexible exchange rates of different countries, and B, the countries with flexible exchanges should avoid the, te the shaft temptation. That means they should have rules, the, cent the central banks of those countries should have rules that made them uh, follow an orthodox economic uh, monetary policy. So he proposed rules, different rules along, along the years that Friedman. The last one was to make uh, money supply grow with uh, the growth, secular growth rate of the economy of the United States. And the combination of rules for the central bank and, on the other hand, flexible exchange rate gave you the flexibility and at the same time uh, escaped all the dangers that we'd had in the, in the 30s, that we'd had in the interwar years. And um, Milton Friedman is an especially uh, interesting and revered person. Uh, this is his car. Um, um, and the MV equal PQ is the number <laughs> he had on his car. <laughs> it's lovely of him. He was always impish, in a way. And, and then he said MV equal PY or whatever. But there you have his belief fundamental belief in the quantity theory. And that fundamental belief was keep careful. Have flexible exchange rates because you can't govern the world market, but uh, have a rule at the central bank which obeys uh, the, 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 uh, the quantity theory. That's not the quantity theory. That's the quantity, as I said in, in, the, in the first lecture, that's the quantity identity. The quantity theory is the connection between M and P, that way. The arrow goes from M to P and not back. And that is the theory that is proposed by the quantitativists and that Friedman defends. Right, so, uh, now I'm going to move to another part of uh, what we're doing because I do want to hear what you have to say on, on what I'm proposing and defending. And since we are uh, studying a, an open economy, well, here we have the balance of payments. And the balance of payments that Mr. Usari was worried, and Kipax were worried, uh, could empty the country of gold, of its sinews. And, uh, and so, uh, what is the role of the balance of payments within the central bank policy and monetary policy of a country? Now, I'm going to say things which may be not accepted. One is that the balance of payments has little value of itself. It's a symptom document. It's, a, it's a, an accounting document that tells you that something is happening in, inside the economy. But in itself, having a surplus or a deficit in the balance of payment in itself is not something to be worried about, as Mr. Hume, David Hume, said because there are mechanism, mechanisms that write that balance if, uh, if we are not the dollar. But we'll see that later. Now, the balance of payments is a document of countries. And countries don't trade. Sometimes, there were the Soviet Union, they traded. But usually, it's people and, uh, and firms that trade. And they have their own balances. And the fact that uh, we take the country as a whole and look as if and look to see if the balance is balanced or not is uh, something that is artificial and as I say I think is more uh, thermometer sort of symptom of the flu you may be suffering so <coughs> the, uh, uh, there, there was a st there were two two kinds of important things to underline in the balance of payments connected with monetary policy one is the Harry Johnson monetary approach, I'll say something just now, and then the fact that you, that 
budget deficits are reflected in deficit in the balance of payments. So if you have a large budget deficit, which is usually uh, financed with debt, and therefore <coughs> creates or puts money into the economy, uh, in, that, in that case, the budget deficit also, um, uh, also um, has an influence on your balance of payments. You'll see it's two theories. One is monetary proofs, the other one is the budget deficit, and I'm sure we can discuss it discuss them later. <clears throat> so one thing that I have to put across, not here because this is, this is on monetary theory, but if we were with, with uh, uh, we were dealing with trade theory, uh, the question is, for a country, having a positive or a negative balance is not important. What you want to have is a large foreign sector. The larger, the more means that people in the country are exchanging things with people in other parts of the world. And that, of course, is, uh, creates a division of labor, which is positive. So uh, we should look at the sum of exports and imports, not as the difference between exports and imports. Harry Johnson and Bob Mundell. Let me say something to relieve a bit about these, both these economists. Bob Mundell is, uh, I find, I found not a very nice person. He, and so I, I t as I'm human, I tend to like my economists to be charming, <laughs> as was the case with Milton Friedman. Uh, he, in fact, however, the more I study what he said, the better I think he is. And he was so good about Gresham's Law. He has an article on Gresham's Law, which is absolutely marvelous there. And he was good again on the balance of payments. And he was pretty good on world money, which we'll see next time. On world money and what the conditions are to have a world government, such as the dollar, still is today. So uh, <coughs> uh, Harry Johnson, uh, on the other hand, was uh, a Canadian economist who's, who was rather charming. He, he drank whiskey from 11 in the morning. And in the visit he paid at the Bank of Spain, I remember we gave him whiskey at 11 in the morning. And he drank more and more. And we toured him in the building of the Bank of Spain. And when he came, it's a magnificent building. And when he came to the room where you have the Goya portraits of the directors, he said, I can see who prints the money. And that was exactly his point of view, was classical in the sense. And when he was in the seminar, he had a little knife, and he sculpted uh, wooden animals. Uh, and he was bored, he fell asleep on the, on the table. Anyhow, he, both he and Mandel understood that if the supply of money falls short of the demand for money, the country will have a balance of payments surplus, uh, because people will try to get money by exporting, and vice versa. If the uh, supply of money is too low, then there will be, uh, if, the, if, the supply of, uh, if the supply of money is too high, then people will try to export it, and that will give you a deficit in the balance of payments. So uh, what he, he told us at the Bank of Spain at that time, this was in the 67, 68, he said, uh, Look, if you have a devaluation, if you do a devaluation, which Spain was at the time in the habit of doing, um, you will have them frequently if you don't accompany them with measures that stop the problem from coming again. It's the accompanying measures that the IMF used to say you needed after a devaluation. And those accompanying measures were, uh, were trying to avoid the deficit in, in the budget and trying to open the economy and all the things that we should say here. So uh, these, these are short-term measures uh, that uh, help to get over the problem of the deficit development. Is it, if that is an indication that things are wrong in, in the economy. And I'll finish with the Mandel impossibility triangle. Oh no, I won't. I'll say something more later. The Mandel Impossibility Triangle tells you what the limitations are 
uh, what the limitations that an open economy and an open market puts in front of the governors of the Bank of England or the governments. Uh, you, can, you can have two of these. You can have free capital flows and a fixed exchange rate. But if you try the free capital flows and a fixed exchange rate to have sovereign, sovereign monetary policy, it doesn't work. And, and the same, you can have a sovereign monetary policy and free capital flow, but you have to, to, uh, to let the exchanges move. Now, this Mandel-Fleming impossibility triangle is a limitation of the sovereignty of the central banks. And that's something that we have to take into account when we discuss central banks next time. And finally, uh, another thing that I want to do and uh, to do today is say something about money, about world money. In, as I said in the last lecture, uh, for a time the world money was the doubloon, the Spanish real de ocho, pieces of eight. That, uh, uh, that uh, as I was remembering, remember, who was who was the parrot who said pieces of eight, pieces of eight? <laughs> I think it was from Robert Louis Stevenson. That's right. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. Pieces of eight, pieces of eight. Well, pieces of eight circulated all over the world because they were high quality. And they were of stable value. And uh, next time I will show you how they were overprinted, those pieces of ink, with, uh, in Saudi Arabia and in China and all other places to show that they became currency of the country. Now, running a world currency is, uh, it has benefits because you have a senior rich, but it has its, its costs. And this is what's happening with the dollar today. There's a cost of running a world reserve currency. Uh, if the reserve currency is a global public, public good, provided by a single currency, then they have to get, forget about you uh, domestic needs. If you think about the domestic needs, then you put in danger in your world currency. Uh, this is another application of the Mandel triangle. And, uh, and so, uh, it's a, sort of an introduction to the limitations of the sovereign, sovereignty of central bank, which I will look on next time. Thank you very much.